Good morning. We welcome all of you who have joined us today. We are in week number 12 of our summer sermon series entitled Empowered by the Spirit. In this series, we are looking at the period of time between the resurrection of Jesus and the day of Pentecost. And all of our focus has been on the first chapter of the book of Acts where Jesus appeared to his disciples and he prepared them for the coming of the day of Pentecost. Our text today, we are going back to the same text that we looked at last week, found in Acts chapter 1 verse 15, Acts chapter 1 verse 15 Uh, If you recall from last week, there were two questions that confronted us as we thought about the story of Judas. Uh, First, why did he do it? And secondly, why did God allow it? And last week's message dealt with the first question. We concluded that the Bible really doesn't give a definitive answer regarding as to why Judas betrayed Jesus. But this week, we're going to look at the other side of the equation. Why would God allow his son to suffer such indignity at the hands of one who claimed to be his friend? Now, as a place to begin, consider three verses that talk about Judas. In Acts chapter 1 verse 16, Peter is speaking to the 120 folks who are gathered there with him. And in verse 16 he says, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in this ministry. That's in the New New International Version. Now notice in verse 16, he says that the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas. Now what scripture is he talking about? Well, He was referring to the Old Testament predictions about Judas that were bound to come true. Over in Psalm 69, verse 25, this again in the New International Version, it says, May their place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in their tents. And again in Psalm 109, verse 8, May his days be few, may another take his place of leadership. You know, when Judas betrayed Jesus in the garden, Peter immediately sprang to Jesus' defense. And, and Jesus waved him off by declaring in Matthew twenty six fifty six, but this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Now, that phrase there, this has all, It refers to the betrayal, it refers to the circumstances surrounding it, and the circumstances flowing from it. All of it happened according to God's plan. Now Jesus said pretty much the same thing in his famous prayer just before Judas arrives in John 17 verse 12. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. Now we could add other examples to that list. And I find it remarkable how consistently the New Testament writers, they see the hand of God in the events surrounding the death of Christ. And although Judas appears to be acting solely on his own initiative, it fits clear, it's clear that his betrayal, it fits into a larger pattern of events, one that is orchestrated by the unseen hand of the living God. Now, that brings us face to face with the doctrine of God's providence, 
which really just means three things. First of all, God has a plan that includes everything that happens in the universe. Um, Point two is, is that God's plan extends to the tiniest details of life. I'm sure you've heard the expression, God is in the details. That's absolutely true. Uh, A third point about that is, is that God uses all events, both good and bad, to accomplish his purposes. See, providence means that God always oversees the entire universe, and nothing truly happens outside of his control. Never do we see God sitting up in heaven saying, huh, I wonder how that happened. No, God's not like that. Nothing catches God by surprise. Now, here are a couple of great texts to keep in mind regarding God's providence and our own personal experience. Uh, The first is a famous statement by Joseph to his brothers over in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. He said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Now, the second familiar passage comes to us out of Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and who are the called according to his purpose. Those verses teach us that God can take the worst things that happen in life and he can turn them for our good and for his glory. Now, that doesn't erase tragedy. It doesn't transform heartache. But it does give us a divine perspective on the challenging times of life that enable us to keep on going when we'd rather give up and quit. Now, how does all this truth apply to Judas Iscariot? In the providence of God, Judas betrayed Jesus. But the truth is, is that Judas actually advanced God's purpose in the world. He did betray the Lord, but he ended up vindicating him. See, by his treachery, Judas set into motion a chain of events that advanced the cause of Jesus Christ to eternal proportions. Now, Let's just think for a few moments about how the sin of Judas, as horrible as it was, actually served many good purposes, none of which were seen on that night, and none of which diminished his true guilt. See, all of this teaches us that simply that God can take that which is evil and he can use it for his good. Now, let me just throw out some lessons that we can learn here. Here's the first lesson. It illuminated the evil motives of the Jewish leaders. See, from the earliest days of Jesus's life, we find that the Jewish leaders were conspiring against him. Herod the Great tried to kill him in Bethlehem. And during his ministry, his greatest opposition came from the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the teachers of the law. It can be fairly said that the common people, by and large, they respected Jesus and they responded positively to his message. And while it be, while not all became believers, many felt a strong attraction to his message. But among the leaders of the nation, only a few followed Christ, and they became secret believers for fear of persecution by their brethren. Uh, Matthew chapter 26, uh, verse 3, it informs us that the leaders of the Jews were looking for an opportunity to arrest Jesus and put him to death. However, they feared to do it during the Feast of Unleavened Bread because of the crowds that thronged Jerusalem. 
See, those leaders, they were evil cowards who hated the Son of God, but they feared a popular uprising if they indeed tried to arrest him. And so Judas solved the problem for them by volunteering to betray the Lord. And when they offered him 30 pieces of silver, he readily accepted, although that was even, you know, it, it was a going price for a slave. Judas's betrayal proved that the Jewish leaders were far from innocent bystanders, uh, bystanders in, in the death of Christ. They wanted him dead, and they used Judas as a convenient means to make that happen. Now, there's a second lesson that comes out of Judas's story. And that is, is that it proved that Jesus was a man of peace. Jesus was a man of peace. You know, when, when Judas kissed Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter impulsively grabbed his sword and he started swinging. He was ready to die for his master and he intended to take a few of the bad guys with him as he went. One swing of his sword whacked off the ear of a fellow by the name of Malchus, who was servant to the high priest. And Jesus, Jesus immediately, uh, he restored that ear and he told Peter to put his sword down. And he reminded Peter that he could call for 12 legions of angels. Now, uh, uh, when it says 12 legions, that's about 72,000 highly trained, heavily armed members of the Angelic Defense League who could come to his rescue at any moment. But he chose instead to allow himself to be arrested, knowing that this would fulfill God's plan. Through one man's treachery, Jesus, Jesus proves himself a man of peace, not a man of war. A third lesson we gain from Judas's betrayal is that it established that Jesus was truly innocent. Jesus was truly innocent. If you'd like an interesting Bible study sometime, take a look at all the different trials of Jesus. It appears that between around 11 o'clock Thursday evening and about 7.30 a.m. on Friday morning, Jesus underwent probably about six different trials, six different hearings. He had one before Annas, he had two before Caiaphas, he had one before the Sanhedrin, and two before Pontius Pilate. And the gospel writers emphasize that although the Jewish leaders earnestly looked for witnesses who could testify against Jesus, they found no one willing to come forward. And so finally, they suborned perjury by putting forward two false witnesses who produced contradictory testimony. And Jesus responded to the false testimony by saying nothing at all. Isaiah 53, 7 says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. The silence of Jesus spoke more loudly than the foolish claims of his lying accusers. When Jesus went before Pilate, the Roman governor received an urgent message from his own wife. Verse 19 of Matthew 27 says, while Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message, don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. You know, all four Gospels ag agree on that uh, three occasions, Pilate rendered the same verdict concerning Jesus. He says, I find no fault 
in him. I find no fault in him. That literally means I find no basis for any of the charges brought against this man. In modern terms, you would call it a summary judgment in favor of Jesus. Later, Pilate gave in to the pressure and ordered Jesus crucified. But this much is clear. He never believed that Jesus was guilty of any of the crimes. As far as Pilate was concerned, he was ordering an innocent man to be put to death, which is why he tried to wash his hands of the whole affair. Jesus truly is the lamb without spot or blemish who died for the sins of the world. The trials that were meant to establish his guilt ended up establishing his innocence for all the world to see. In such a manner, Judas served God's purposes through his wicked act of betrayal. A fourth lesson we see out of his betrayal is that it fulfilled Bible prophecy to the letter. See, the gospel writers record many Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. The total number of prophecies were well over a hundred. Here are just five specific prophecies that were fulfilled when Judas betrayed Jesus. Psalm 41 verse 9 tells us that a close friend will betray Jesus. It says, and Psalm 41, 9, even my close friend whom I trusted, he who shared my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Zechariah 11, verse 12 alludes to the exact amount Judas was paid, 30 pieces of silver. He said in verse 12 of Zechariah 11, I told them, if you think it best, give me my pay. But if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. In the very next verse, in Zechariah eleven thirteen, the allusion is, is that Judas would give the money back. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the handsome price at which they priced me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. Now, we've already mentioned these last two fulfilled prophecies. Uh, Psalm 69, 25, his, the reputation destroyed forever. And Psalm 109, verse 8, where he was replaced by another man, Matthias. See, Judas didn't know it, and he doesn't get any credit for it, but his dastardly deed actually fulfilled predictions given by the Holy Spirit hundreds of years before he was ever born. So it fulfilled prophecy to the letter. A fifth lesson we see out of the betrayal of Judas was that it teaches that God ordains both the means and the ends. Now, we all understand that God intended that Jesus would die for the sins of the whole world. But sometimes, sometimes we forget that when God ordains a particular end, he also ordains the means to to that end. See, nothing is ever left to chance with God. We see this clearly in the life of Christ. Um, God himself, had foreordained every detail surrounding the death of his son. Even his enemies played into God's hand, though they did not know it at the time. God's plan included the time of Jesus' death, Passover. It included the place of Jesus' death, Jerusalem. It included the opposition of the Jewish leaders. It included the betrayal of Judas. It even included the price that Judas would receive for his act of treachery, 30 pieces of silver. Everything else in the story fits into God's plan. The crown of thorns, the scourging, the trials, 
Pilate's testimony, his verdict of death, a man to help carry the cross, the place of death, Golgotha, and the moment of death, three o'clock in the afternoon, the time when the Passover lambs were sacrificed at the temple. God's plan even extended to having Jesus buried in a borrowed tomb. You know, the fact that God ordains both the means and the ends should surely encourage us as we face our own trials. You know, often in the confusion of life, we cannot see the ends, much less the means God intends for us. But the story of Judas teaches us that nothing happens by accident. Everything fits into God's plans. When God determines where we will end up, he'll also determine how we're going to get there. A sixth lesson we find from Judas' uh, betrayal is that it shows the difference between professing believers or, or professing Christ and truly possessing him. See, the sad story of Judas stands as a warning to religious people not to trust in their religion. He is the preeminent insider who knew Jesus as well as anyone has ever known him. And yet in the end, Judas never really knew Jesus at all. Going to church won't make you a Christian any more than sleeping in a garage makes you a car or going to a restaurant makes you a chef. Christianity is not about religion. It's about a life-changing relationship with the Son of God. We are saved by living faith in the Son of God, not by outward religious observation. Yeah, the way to God, uh, the way to heaven is only Jesus and Jesus only. Now that leads me to a simple question. Are you a professor or a possessor? Do you merely profess Christ and trust in your religious habits to save you? Or do you possess Christ in your heart by faith? Judas professed Christ, but he did not possess him, which is why he ended up where he did. We return now to the original question. Why did God allow Judas to betray Jesus? Well, here's my answer. He allowed Judas to betray Jesus so that Jesus could become the Savior of the world. There's no better example of the providence of God at work through the actions of a sinful man. Was Judas wrong to do what he did? Absolutely yes. Is he guilty of betrayal? Yes. Is he in hell for what he did? We saw last week, yes, he is. Was his betrayal a part of God's plan? Yes. Judas served God's purposes, even though what he did was wrong, and he ended up where he did. To say it another way, there is a man in hell today who has been there for 2,000 years, even though what he did advanced God's plan to save the world. This truth about Judas illustrates God's control of every event in the universe. Peter told those early believers that the scripture had to be fulfilled. He meant that the betrayal had to happen the way that it did. God planned everything down to the tiniest detail. Judas didn't know it and neither did any of the other disciples. But God's fingerprints were all over his act of betrayal. Now, that absolutely does not lessen his guilt, but it does increase our appreciation of God's sovereignty over the affairs of men. Now, one last point is in order here. 
Although God was at work in the betrayal, you would not have been able to have seen it that evening. Peter didn't see it. All he saw was the treachery of Judas. Nothing happened to Jesus that night or later the next day on Good Friday that made any sense when it happened. It only made sense on Sunday morning when Jesus arose from the dead. Now that's generally the way of life for all of us. The greater the pain, the more difficult it is to see the fingerprints of God. You know, in those moments, we often feel so alone in the chaos of circumstances as life crumbles in around us. And it's only as when we look back that we clearly see that God was there all along. He was working behind the scenes for our good and for his glory. We talk a lot about Good Friday, and we rejoice much about Resurrection Day. But there was a middle day, there was Saturday, that was silent. See, Saturday was a day of uncertainty. All the hopes and the dreams of the disciples were lying in that tomb. And in their view, the ultimate tragedy had, had occurred. Jesus had been cut down before his time. All their expectations and their outlook for the future were in shambles. They had no idea what the next morning would bring. They couldn't see the victory ahead. They had no idea the power and the glory that was about to be revealed. All they knew was that things were bad. And all they could do was to wait in fear, just waiting to see what was going to happen next. That was Silent Saturday. You know, I have found that most of us live our lives on Silent Saturday. We live huddled in fear between tragedy and triumph, and all we can see are the failures and the losses that we had on Friday. We never dare to imagine the conquest and the rejoicing that Sunday will bring. We are so focused on the catastrophes of yesterday and the disappointments and the anxieties of today that we can't even conceive of tomorrow's victories. If that's where you are today, confronted with impossibilities, confronted with heartbreak, take heart. God is about to do something marvelous that you can't even imagine. Don't worry, it may not make any sense to you today, but God will have the last word. The tomb is empty. Tomorrow is coming. In the words of a 19th century writer, hated, hatred, treachery, and deceit will not prevail against the church of God. Every evil in the world must somehow serve God's purpose. Now, what's our response to this truth? Well, first, we need to bow in submission before the mysterious ways of God. Um, I can't explain it. You can't explain it. God works in mysterious ways, and we need to bow before him. We also must entrust our lives to the God who cares for us. No matter what we go through in life, we need to understand that God loves us and he's, he, he is for us. He is not against us as believers. We must also place our confidence in God's ultimate purpose for us. We need to know that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord, who are the called according to his purpose. So be encouraged, child of God. He has not brought us this far to cause us to fail. 
You know, those listening to my words today um, are in many different situations. Some are near to Christ, even at the door of salvation. Some of you might be spiritually confused. Some may be going through tough times. Some may need encouragement. There may be some of you who are praying for a loved one to be saved. There are some who are facing great difficulties in the days ahead. There are some who have extremely serious health problems. There are those who see no hope for the future. There are folks who are estranged from their family and their friends. There are others who struggle with doubts. And there are folks who struggle with secret sins. And all of us stand in need of the grace of God. But may I just repeat to you what I said just a moment ago? God has not brought us this far to cause us to fail. God ordains the means and the ends of life. He has but one end, to make you and I like Jesus. And he has many means to carry out that purpose, including some that are difficult for us to understand. But all of them come from the hand of the Lord. A God who can bring something good out of betrayal can be trusted to accomplish something good in the things of your life. God is not finished with you yet. Don't give up on him because he certainly has not given up on you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for what you've done for us. Lord, once again, as we consider the story of Judas, help us to see the good that you brought out of it. Lord, it was horrible, his betrayal, it was sinful, and Father, he is paying for that today. But Lord, we also see redemption, how you took something terrible, And you made something good out of it. Father, we pray today that you would encourage our hearts. Because there are folks listening to me today. They are looking over the rubble of of failed dreams. And they are looking over uh, the destruction of, of their life, Father. And they're wondering, can anything be salvaged from this? But Lord, we know that you can take the worst of circumstances. You can take the worst conditions and you can restore them for our good and for your glory. Father, I pray today you would encourage hearts. Thank you and praise you. We just ask these things in your name. Amen. We hope that you'll join us next week for part 13 of our series, Empowered by the Spirit. Lord willing, we'll continue to look at how the Holy Spirit prepared the disciples for the coming of the day of Pentecost. We're going to be focusing on Acts chapter 1 leading up to those events. Don't forget, Lord willing, we'll be back this coming Wednesday evening for our live online Bible study, 6.30 on Wednesday night. This week, we're looking at the life of Paul again. Uh, uh, We're looking at part 17 of this study, and we're going to be looking specifically out of Acts chapter 17. This Bible study series is on the life of Paul. It's only online, and it's the only place that you can view it. So I hope that you'll join us. If you miss any of the Bible studies or messages, you can check them out on Facebook or you can go to our YouTube channel and watch them there. 
Just type in Lebanon First Church of God into the search bar on YouTube and you should be able to find our channel. If you have a Google account, a Gmail account, you can log into YouTube using your Google account and you can actually subscribe to our channel. So check that out. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.